a rock shelter in the Libyan desert. The site of an unprecedented discovery. A tiny mummified child. Until the moment he was unearthed, everyone thought the Egyptians had invented mummification in Africa. But this discovery led Dr. Savino de Lernia and his team to develop a new theory, which challenges everything we thought we knew about ancient Egypt. Mummification knowledge wasn't born in Egypt, but in another place, in another culture, in another part of the history of the Africa. Who were these people? Where did they come from? How did they achieve this incredible high standard of mummification at such an early date? An unknown people mummifying their dead long before the Egyptians, this child would prove to be the key to unlocking a long-lost African culture. the Sahara. This is the largest desert in the world. It's also one of the hottest places on Earth and one of the most remote. Italian archaeologist Dr. Savino de Lernia of the University of Rome has been driving for two days. His destination is the Akakus Mountains in southwestern Libya. It's a North African country. To the west is Algeria, to the east, Egypt. This inhospitable terrain has driven away all but a handful of Tuareg nomads. But it was once home to a family who mummified their child. Year after year, Savino returns to this majestic landscape hoping to uncover its secrets. It all began 40 years ago with the discovery of the little mummified boy, Juan Mahujaj. He took his name from the rock shelter where he was found. It has taken Savino and his colleagues decades to reveal the full significance of this discovery. I think that mummy and the rock shelter really started the archaeological and historical reconstruction of the ancient civilizations here in the Sahara. We think of Libya's population today as largely Middle Eastern. Yet the team still believe that thousands of years ago, this area was inhabited by black Africans from the south. But apart from some rock art depicting black hunters, archaeologists had no proof of this. The discovery of the mummy changed all that. The significance of the black mummies. We have the first evidence of black people in the area that it was supposed to be, but we hadn't had evidence of this. This was the beginning of an extraordinary quest that would ultimately reveal an unknown African culture. The Juan Mahujaj rock shelter is a simple place a ledge just wide enough to provide shade from the midday sun. Savino has returned to the rock shelter where he meets Tuareg tribesman, Mr. Ramadani, who witnessed the discovery of the mummy. They focus on one small area, the place where Savino's predecessor, Professor Mori, actually found the mummy. It was still already visible because it was partially brought to light by natural erosion. So um, we have to, to imagine that the, the exact position of the, of the one who just mummy uh, should be s somewhere just here. When a small sack came to light, no one was prepared for what it contained. They opened this sack and they found the mummy inside. So it was really amazing. Soon after he died, this young boy was put in a fetal position, then embalmed and placed in a sack made of antelope skin. The sack was then insulated by a layer of leaves. This careful preparation protected his small body from the elements for the next five and a half thousand years. 
the Italian archaeologists knew they had found important evidence. It wasn't just the apparent color of the mummy's skin, it was the shape of his skull which suggested he was black. And if he was, this could rewrite the history of mummification in Africa. They needed to be sure. After a tortuous 10-day camel journey to the nearest town with their fragile cargo, the team returned to Rome to have the mummy analyzed. Dr. Giorgio Manzi of the University of Rome is the world's foremost expert on human remains in Libya, and his department boasts an impressive collection of Libyan skulls. The reason why the members of the Italian team uh, in the 50s inferred that uh, the child was uh, a black child, a Negro child, is mainly a consideration of his face, especially the length here of the root of the nose, or also here, the moving forward of the mouth. Examination of the mummy's teeth also revealed his age at death. When the Italian team first examined the Wamuja child, they looked at the teeth and found that it was very young. Especially using X-rays, it was easy to determine the exact age, looking at teeth still in the bone, in the alveolus. So the team had established that Juan Mahujaj was a black, two-and-a-half-year-old boy. But it was the results of the carbon dating which were so amazing. Juan Mahujaj was 5,500 years old. This made him the oldest black mummy ever found in Africa. But where did he come from? Who had mummified this boy a thousand years before the Egyptians supposedly invented mummification in Africa? The origins of the five and a half thousand year old black mummy were a mystery. To find out more about the boy, Savino returns to the Tripoli Museum, where the mummy now rests. I think the, the most impressive evidence of mummification is the skin on the skull. You can see all around the skull, the skin of the child. You can see here, just in the, along the spine and the rib cage, we have a lot of skin, which is really very, very rare to be found. You see here, the remains of this organic matter. This is really the remains of the true interior of the mummy. It's impossible to find this kind of evidence without the process of mummification. Another point is the first act of mummification is, the, is a cut along the stomach and the removal of old interiors. And probably they put something in an organic matter just to, to, to stop any kind of bacterial activity inside. Uh, as much as the Egyptians did in the Nile Valley. Juan Mahujaj was mummified in a sophisticated way using a process called evisceration. This means that incisions were made along his stomach and thorax. Then his organs were removed and an organic preservative inserted to stop his body from decomposing. As the oldest eviscerated mummy ever found in Africa, Juan Mahujaj suddenly found himself on the world stage. Academics like mummy expert and Egyptologist Dr. Joanne Fletcher were intrigued. I first became interested in the black mummy around probably around 15 years ago with the publication of a, a major work on mummification all over the world. The key point of interest in the black mummy is the fact that it's been eviscerated. The internal organs have been removed from the chest, from the thorax, and of course from the abdomen. And because of this very sophisticated form of evisceration, what we have is essentially the earliest form of complete mummification yet found in Africa. And it's interesting that everybody always goes to Egypt as the home of mummification. And yet, in fact, from the dates of the black mummy, there's certainly nothing like that going on in Egypt at that time. So my question to myself was, did this black mummy um, in any way contribute to the later Egyptian practice of complete mummification, or did the two traditions develop independently? Popular tradition has it 
that Egypt is the only ancient civilization in Africa. Its art and religion were renowned, and according to the orthodox view, it was definitely the home of African mummification. But there are those who believe that the black mummy is challenging this established school of thought. Professor David Mattingly specializes in Saharan civilizations. When a mummy is discovered somewhere in the central Sahara, it's perhaps not surprising that the average person in the street might assume the direct involvement of Egypt somewhere in, in this process. And I think it's a common image that Egypt is like a searchlight shining out, illuminating those dark spaces of, of, of the Sahara. And yet Juan Mahuchaj was artificially mummified 1,500 miles to the west of the Nile Valley and 1,000 years before the Egyptians were eviscerating their dead. Was it possible that mummification in Africa began in the central Sahara and not in Egypt? And if the Egyptians didn't prepare the black mummy, who did? It really does beg the question, who on earth could achieve such a remarkably preserved corpse? I mean, who, who were these people that could do this? I mean, I personally know very little about them. So where did they come from? How did they achieve this incredible high standard of mummification at such an early date? Finding out more about these people and their culture is exactly what Savino de Lernia has been doing for the past 12 years. His search for answers began in the rock shelter of Juan Mahujaj, where careful excavations have yielded vital clues. We have here the all the history of the Juan Mahujaj occupation. This charcoal, the remains of a fireplace, probably 4,000 years ago, 5,000 up to 6,000 years ago, which is the Juan Mahujaj time. And this was the ancient floor of the same age of the Wamahujaj mummy. And you still have the gold dropping. The fact is that during Wamahujaj era, the most important uh, part of their life was cattle. This seemed surprising. Cattle don't live in deserts, but they feature strongly in rock art throughout the Akakus Mountains. More than 50% of the paintings from the Wamhojat period um, were cattle. So this really explains uh, the importance of this animal 6,000 years ago. Cattle and goats. Juan Mahujaj's people were evidently animal herders. But how could they survive in this desert? The remains of a simple plant provided the first clue that the home of Juan Mahujaj once looked very different. During the, the, the Juan Mahujaj era, more than 5,000 years ago, 5,500 years ago, we have here evidence of pollen from tifa plants, which are plants really very water demanding. Tifa plants still exist in the region but they thrive only in oases where water is abundant. So could this whole area have once been lush savanna? It was time for the climatologists to provide some answers. One of NASA's satellites brought the Sahara to the attention of Dr. Kevin White. He now heads a team at Reading University which uses the latest technology to study ancient environments. NASA scientists were looking at images of the Western Desert as an analogy of their studies of the Martian surface. And they were looking at it with using radar instruments and comparing those with uh, more conventional satellite images. And they discovered a whole series of buried river networks underneath what is now a sand sheet. 
the radar penetrated the desert surface to reveal an ancient system of river channels that once fed into vast lakes. These lakes dried up long ago and are now what the scientists call paleo lakes. Kevin White is using this technique to uncover similar channels in Libya's central Sahara. But it is the paleo lake sediment that Kevin is most interested in because it tells the story of the past. Lake sediments tend to capture a lot of information about what was going on in the surrounding slopes and surrounding landscape and we can start to reconstruct vegetation communities uh, we can start to reconstruct something of the, uh, the hydrology, the nature of the water. And we also get a fossil record which can be useful in some circumstances. But as you can see, it's a bit of a difficult place to get into. To reconstruct these climates, the team needs to collect field samples for analysis. Kevin's colleague, Dr Nick Brooks, is planning a trip to Libya using satellite maps. This is a difficult bit up here, up over that dune there. Up over this way, and then there's definitely a gap through there. So yeah. this is easy. Yeah. Uh, you've just got one more little uh, dune to get over there, and then you reach this area this gap. through that gap there, I guess, and then over the top of that dune. If you can get up to this point here. Then it's just downhill, really, down a big yeah. slip face there. Look at that. This is a paleo lake. We know people were living here around about the time of Wan Mahujaj because we found pottery and stone tools from around that period. looking for is things like organic lake deposits so we can radiocarbon date them. We can also date things like snail shells from freshwater snails that we know must have lived in a wet environment. We can date animal bone uh, if we can find bones of things like elephants and rhinoceros and crocodiles and fish even that would be fantastic. Taking the route up. Nick and Savino are colleagues. They're heading for a dry riverbed, a few hours from the Juan Mahujaj rock shelter. Could the evidence at this site prove this area once looked very different? So what was your favourite out of the whole, the whole suite of engravings we've got up in Massandouche? My favourite one? Yeah. Uh, actually, it's the cat-like figures. Yeah. Very, it's it's yeah, really amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Matan Douche is one of the most famous rock art sites in Africa. You can see the, the rhino here, upside down, with the two uh, human figures, still the, uh, some kind of axe, oh, hand right, axe yeah. here. There is a lot of animals, there is the, the elephant and uh, two or three giraffes with a lot of superimpositions. Yeah, it's quite complex. But it's, the, the, the giraffe is really impressive. Yeah. It's very well done. And shame it's lost its nose, but it's still pretty good. Yeah, and the three yeah, yeah. cat-like cat figures over there. And my, my favorite is the, the one on the corner, just with the, it's, I think it's the masterpiece of yeah. the rock art yeah. in the Wadi Madanlouche area. Absolutely. Hey, I think we found the giraffe's nose down here. Really? It looks like it, yeah. Yeah, you're so right. So there we go. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It hasn't gone far. Enigmatic figure. Yeah. Another nice giraffe. 
picture of. You know, this could be could be a lion. The rib cage and yeah. the back is quite quite evident. Yeah. All the animals depicted here live only in savannas. But it was the next carving that completed the picture for Nick. This is one of the most famous rock wow. engravings here in Wari Matandush. It's the representation of a crocodile with a wild fauna style, which is believed to be the oldest style of rock art here in Wari Matandush. It's really spectacular, and we know that things like elephants and giraffe and some of the other big animals can live in quite dry environments, yeah. not as dry as we've got here today. Yeah. But this is really the final proof. This, this was a river, you know. Absolutely. Crocodiles don't live in arid environments. Yeah, absolutely. So. so looking at the carvings on the rock face here, we can, with a bit of imagination, speculate about what the landscape would have been like, what would have been going on. We'd probably be standing at the water's edge here, yeah. maybe when it was a seasonal river or something. Yeah. We'd have maybe some hippos down here um, in the shallows. This probably would have been a dangerous place to stand because we would have had crocodiles coming, coming out of the water onto the back. There's a lot of animals, wild animals just, just in the place. Perhaps elephants coming down to the water. Over there where we would have had a savanna landscape and I saw a lion on the rock carving, so perhaps we would have had lions hunting the giraffe and hunting gazelles or whatever, as well as the people that were here hunting the animals. It's a, it's a piece of African mm. landscape. Just uh, like you'd see in Southern Africa today, like Zimbabwe or yeah. Tanzania or Kenya today, parts of, parts of those countries. Conjuring up the image of this Garden of Eden in the Sahara today takes a lot of imagination. But it is still possible to experience what an ancient lake was like, even in the middle of the desert. Gaborone is one of a handful of oases left in the Sahara, and it gives us a glimpse of the environment during the time of Juan Mahujaj, the black mummy. Growing around the edge of the lake are living fossils that take us straight back in time. This vegetation, Nick, is exactly the vegetation we found in, in one more rock shelter. And we actually found the, the pollen grains in the excavation, and uh, they are 5,500 wow. years old, so it's exactly the same vegetation. So this means that at the time of one more just mummy, we had this kind of plant, so this kind of environment, yeah. so it means a lot of water. Armed with samples, Nick returned to England. His results would not only complete the picture of this ancient Saharan landscape, but they would ultimately help answer a much greater question about the origins of ancient Egypt itself. Dr. Nick Brooks and the climate team at Reading University have spent years collecting samples in the Libyan desert. Analysis of their data has given them enough information to produce an environmental model going back 10,000 years. I'll show you what we've got. It's very exciting. OK, let's give it a try. The lake's reconstructed according to our field data. So we're going right quite deeply into the sand mm. sea here. Yeah. It's easier flying over it than driving through it. And that's a lot quicker on here. The model takes us back from the arid present day through the time of Juan Mahujaj to when the Saharan climate changed dramatically, covering the dunes with vegetation and turning the valleys into lakes. It all happened 10,000 years ago, when a shift in the Earth's axis caused the tropical monsoons to penetrate right into the central Sahara. And with these rains came the ancestors of Juan Mahujaj. 10,000 years ago, humans, black humans coming from the south, following the monsoon belt, occupied the central range of the Sahara. This led to the first occupation of the central Sahara. And we have these black people in the central ranges, in the Akakus Mountains and in the immediate surroundings. And they were not the only ones. Around 7,000 years ago, people from Mesopotamia and Palestine arrived introducing cattle and goats into the central Sahara. 
So we can we can imagine that the uh, the central Sahara, the Akakus Mountains, um, has been one of the first world melting pot because we have black people coming from the south and and say uh, something like white people coming from the Near East and probably Eastern Sahara. Today in Libya, you can see the legacy of this early melting pot. Walking down the streets of, of present-day Libya, I'm always struck by the, the incredible diversity of humanity that, that one encounters. And that reflects broadly the sort of crossroads position of, of, of Libya within the Mediterranean, with its Saharan hinterland. Uh, Libya's been a great melting pot throughout its history. But what's really surprising is how far back in time that goes, this intermingling of white Mediterranean types with Negroid Saharan types. And that we can see very clearly from this work in the Central Sahara. This ethnic diversity explains some intriguing rock art that initially puzzled Savino. The face of these people are not black as one more judge, but they are white. And you can see this looking at the profile of the face and to the style. It is this mixed-race culture which mummified Juan Marujaj. But what kind of society did this young boy live in? We should imagine that we uh, have here probably four or five families. 25, 30, 40 people living here. They used round huts. Each family has probably two or three cows and probably 10, 15 goats. Rivers, trees, bushes, really, it was a different environment. And they had time. They had time to stay here and, and people sitting down and prepare things. You have to imagine that these people had to meet and to discuss and even to claim rights over land, pastures and water. So it means social obligations, it means cultural rules. And I think that the, uh, the, the one who judge mummy is really um, a piece, a very important, a very important piece of this evidence. But what else can the black mummy tell us about this society? One important clue is the ostrich eggshell necklace that he was still wearing unbroken when he was first discovered. We still have some few beads of a necklace of ostrich eggshells. In ancient societies, the inclusion of grave goods indicated ritual and ceremony, and the mummification process suggested something else. Even though Juan Muhujaj is the only complete Saharan mummy ever found, these people have been mummifying their dead for hundreds, if not thousands of years before the boy died. Now this is a really sophisticated form um, of mummification and it wouldn't have just appeared from out of nowhere. Uh, the black mummy is obviously almost the end result of a very complex development in this very highly skilled procedure. But why was this young boy mummified? Was it because he was special? The family of Juan Mohoja, we, we, we can say, was not particularly rich or particularly powerful. The fact is that this kind of pastoral society were quite egalitarian in their social organization. The fact that this is a very small child that's been mummified with a great deal uh, of care and attention suggests that this is a society which um, doesn't necessarily judge individuals by their achievements. So the fact that people uh, were obviously mummifying those in society who are frequently regarded as, as the least important, the children, presumably in the hope that they would live again in some form of afterlife, can I think tell us a great deal about uh, those responsible. There's obviously a great deal of compassion and love that would have gone into such a, um, a procedure and a desire perhaps to keep the dead child with one at all times. But it was the date Juan Mahujaj was mummified that raised the key question. 
Did mummification in Africa begin here in the central Sahara? We have here, really, in this very place, the oldest mum in Africa is more than 5,000 years old and is at least 1,000 years older than the Egyptian mummies. So this means that the uh, mummification process, the mummification knowledge, wasn't born in Egypt. And we have here the first evidence of this. So it's really very tempting to suggest some kind of, say, movement or some kind of circulation of ideas from central Sahara spring, springing out up to the Nile Valley. So it is really tempting to do this. But as archaeologists, I need hard evidence to do this. Savino knew that many of the descendants of the Black Mummy had been forced to move out of the central Sahara just 500 years after his death. The environmental work had confirmed another dramatic climatic change around 5,000 years ago, returning the Sahara to its present arid state. The gentler climate of the Nile Valley beckoned. Could Wan Muhujaj's people have ended up moving east and taking their mummification knowledge with them? And if so, did these central Saharan people bring any other rituals into the Nile Valley. The archaeologists began to look for other traditions shared by both cultures. Savino's search led him on a journey of exploration all over the Libyan Sahara. His quest took years. <laughs> But eventually, he found his first clue. It was an unremarkable pile of rocks on a boulder-strewn plain called the Mesak, just 60 miles from the Juan Mahujaj rock shelter. It was like finding a needle in a haystack. Savino had stumbled onto a mysterious circular monument, which would prove that cattle held a ritual significance in the lives of the Saharan people. It included bloody ritual slaughter, here was evidence of a cattle cult. The engraving of this cattle, uh, when I discovered it, uh, told me that probably this monument had something to deal with the cattle cult. And so I decided to excavate this uh, circular monument, and we found the bones and charcoal of cattle. So um, this was the really the f very first hard evidence, archaeological evidence, of some kind of ritual connected to the cattle cult. Cattle bones, dated around the time of Juan Mahujaj, were buried in a circular stone monument with a diameter of almost 10 feet, and pottery was left as ritual offerings. But the burial was only part of Savino's discovery. In a stone circle next to the grave, he found the slaughter area. What is it tempting to suggest that probably the, the cow, which um, the, the cow has been actually killed here, and probably uh, people uh, prepare the cattle, they share their meat, and after they um, they made some holy fire to. To, to, to start with their ritual. And after that, they just bring a small part of bones and they put a part of these bones just inside this monument and another small part just at the base of the engraved slab. The whole evidence is some people uh, bringing the animal here, slaughtering it and sharing their meat and after uh, putting their, their bones here. Savino believes these people were praying for rain. They sacrificed what was most precious to them, their cattle. And cattle rituals would play an important role in the Egypt of the Nile Valley. 
the discovery of the ritual areas for the slaughter of sacred cattle in Libya, in the Saharan cultures, very much puts me in mind of later practices in Pharaonic Egypt, whereby um, cattle uh, were ritually slaughtered within the temple precincts and then offered um, as the sacred offering uh, on a daily basis to the, the gods in question. Not only that, but during the funerary cult of the deceased, where human mummies were buried in tombs, the sort of high point of the funeral rite was to uh, sever the foreleg of a cow. Um, and while it was still quivering with life, offer it to the mouth of the deceased in order to transfer the life which still could be seen twitching in this severed limb. This would be then transferred into the body of the deceased human with the hope, the fervent hope, that these people would then live again in the afterlife. And so you have cattle used as a means to transfer sacred power, sacred knowledge, uh, sacred energy, if you like, into uh, deceased humans. And so you have this sort of symbiotic relationship between human and animal that's very clear in Pharaonic Egypt and, as, as we're seeing in, in the Saharan cultures, equally clear further west. So the Egyptian idea that cattle provided a channel between humans and gods was not a new one. In fact, the cattle cult had been present in the central Sahara for thousands of years before it reached its zenith in the Nile Valley. It's quite tempting to suggest that some kind of relationship actually should exist between this important, huge, cultural evidence of cattle cult in the Sahara and the rise of cattle cult in the Egyptian ideology. I think it's quite, it's quite, quite likely. Savino had established that like in Egypt, both mummification and cattle cults were central to this Saharan society. And then in a dry wadi, less than a mile from the cattle monuments, he found something even more conclusive. The engraving of an animal-headed figure. The most exciting subject of this engraving is Shiri the dog mask. Uh, this kind of human beings are actually one of the most important uh, subjects represented in the Mesak area. We can understand the age of the engraving uh, from the color, which is very black. It means very, very old. What is the relevance of this kind of dating from these engravings? Is that the, the presence of human beings, mask bearing, and in this case we have dog mask, is much older than the, um, the kind of evidence we have in the Nile Valley. Although organic matter in the crevices of the engraving was carbon dated to 5,600 years, Savino believes this carving could be as much as a thousand years older. I find it very interesting that these animal-headed human figures exist outside of Egypt um, at such an incredibly early date. And then later in pharaonic culture you find exactly the same uh, motifs repeated in the very sophisticated Egyptian art form. The Egyptian god Anubis has become one of the most recognizable symbols of ancient Egypt. This is Anubis, the ancient Egyptian god of embalming and the guardian of the dead. And his likeness was actually used by the ancient Egyptians in mask form, in the form we see in front of us, um, during the very sacred rituals of the funeral. In funerary rites, uh, one of the priests would wear this exact same mask and perform the magical rituals which would enable the dead to live again in the afterlife. And I find it really fascinating that in the Saharan cultures, we're finding petroglyphs of, of human beings wearing jackal masks, uh, almost dog-headed figures, in fact, uh, at least a thousand years prior to the emergence of Anubis in ancient Egyptian mythology. The overwhelming evidence suggests that this defining Egyptian cult of human-animal worship actually arose in the Sahara. But could a small, obscure society really have had this much influence? It was time to widen the search, and the evidence found right across Africa would astound everyone.
The archaeologists had to know whether the culture of one Muhujaj, the black mummy, had spread beyond Libya. 500 miles to the south, a site in modern-day Niger began to provide the answers. In the 1980s, French archaeologists uncovered pottery, human burials and rock art, which were all almost exactly the same as the evidence found in Libya by the Italians. And similar artifacts were found throughout North Africa. It looked like this culture was far more widespread than anyone had ever imagined. We have just here Tripoli. We have here Cairo and, and the Nile. And just in the center, we have the Akakos Mountains. And we have uh, Algeria, uh, Libya, Egypt, and Sudan, and Chad, and Niger, and, and Mali. So this area is bigger than Europe, so it means that all this very, very large extent was inhabited during ancient times uh, by the same ancient African Saharan culture. The size of this culture was extraordinary. It spanned most of North Africa, from Mali to the western fringes of Egypt itself. In many ways, this vast Saharan culture really didn't have to go very far in terms of physical distance in order to influence the people of the Nile Valley. They were almost there, so it was just a very short step from the western desert of Egypt right into the Nile Valley itself. The big picture was almost complete, but the archaeologists still needed proof that this African culture had affected Egypt they needed evidence of a direct link. They needed proof of contact. The Italians turned to the most prevalent artifact in the Akakus Mountains, pottery. At the Wanafuda cave, Savino had already discovered pottery shards dating back to the earliest pottery in Africa. Would they find the proof here that the Sahara had directly influenced the Nile Valley? We can still see this is a piece of pottery and probably is 9,000 years old. It is decorated with impressions, with a waving, with a waving motion. And it's, this pottery is among the oldest in the world. The Italian team collected enough pottery shards to reconstruct an entire pot. It's now back in Rome with Savino. This is the pottery we have in the area one Hoja, which is typical for the kind of decoration, probably 6,000 years old. This kind of decoration, which is, uh, it is made with impressions, with a stick, we find pottery uh, decorated in this identical way in a very large area. This pot was not a one-off. It was representative of a distinctive Saharan style. And it was completely different from the undecorated pottery made during the same period in the Nile Valley. But then excavations in the southern Nile Valley revealed something extraordinary. Suddenly, around 6,000 years ago, a new style of pottery appeared. It was Saharan, and this was proof of contact. So uh, it means that uh, either people or, in my view, ideas and, and, and this kind of communication arrived in the southern Nile Valley some 6,000 years ago. It all made sense. The Sahara was drying, and a people in search of water had to move. The nearby Nile River and its fertile valley was like a magnet. This was the final piece of the puzzle. Here was evidence that the Saharan culture had reached and influenced the Nile Valley. But what had happened to these people? Burial monuments, rock art and the black mummy were some of the only finds to prove they'd ever existed. 
Despite their influence and sophistication, only a few traces of this remarkable culture have been reclaimed. Their history had literally been covered by the sands of the Sahara. The heritage of ancient Egypt and the central Sahara have been incredibly intertwined over the last 10,000 years. But if we go back to about five to 8,000 years ago, I think we find a period in which the relationship was expressed in a rather different way to the sort of common uh, model that we have today. Instead of that searchlight shining out from Egypt, illuminating the desert, maybe we need to think about a desert culture which is shining many little lights on a fledgling Egypt in the Nile Valley. And that's actually going to play a very important role in the formation of ancient Egypt itself. I find it quite extraordinary that this central Saharan civilization uh, shows all the features we generally associate with later Egyptian pharaonic culture. And mummification is a prime example there are definite links between the two cultures. As to which came first, um, most Egyptologists would like to think Egypt, but uh, I think a lot of this uh, information from the Saharan cultures really uh, must make us think again. The journey of discovery has led a dedicated team of archaeologists to uncover the secret origins of Egypt, the greatest ancient civilization ever known. And it all began with a chance discovery in a remote corner of the Sahara of the body of a mummified boy, whose legacy was far greater than his parents could ever have imagined. Amo just was um, a little boy of two years and a half, uh, living with his family in the Akakos Mountains more than 5,500 years ago. They were sub-Saharan people, uh, Africans, and they accidentally gave the world the oldest black mummy it has yet seen. 